Uh, just want to give you a little heads up about who's coming uh, in the uh, course of the year uh, to uh, present in this series. Who else do we have coming? Uh, so we have uh, Arnold Donald, some of you will know, who's the uh, CEO of Carnival Corporation. Uh, by the way, I did clear that with Richard Fain, who is uh, the chairman of our board of trustees, who's the CEO of Royal Caribbean. Uh, so don't, don't worry, it's all politically uh, correct. Um, then uh, we have um, one of our alumni, Alexandra Villock. Alex, uh, to many of us, uh, from the Miami Herald Media Company uh, in September. Uh, we have uh, a good friend of mine for many, many years, uh, a veteran of children's television, now runs the uh, Sesame Workshop, um, you know, which is uh, a very interesting issue. How do you adapt Sesame Street for the uh, digital age and for the era of the iPhone? Um, we have a wonderful guy, uh, we just uh, confirmed yesterday, Ron Williams. Uh, Ron is, a, is really one of the top non-executive directors in the United States. He's uh, the former CEO of Aetna uh, and uh, is on the board of American Express and a, a raft of other companies. So he's going to talk to us about corporate governance. Uh, and then, because by the time you get to December, you know, you really want to relax a little bit, right? Uh, so we've got the CEO of Boston Beer Company, you'll know that is the uh, owner of the Sam Adams brand. Um, so we're hoping that we're going to be able to get some excess inventory uh, <laughs> shipped uh, from Boston, hopefully not lingering too long in the Miami heat before it's uh, consumed. Um, we're going to have that sent down for uh, December the 4th. So, as always, uh, we've got uh, a, a really good lineup of varied speakers, and uh, the effort here is to bring uh, you only the best. And talking about only the best, uh, tonight we have uh, Dr. Bruce Irwin, uh, who is really the father of urgent care in the United States. And uh, I'm not going to give you a lot of biography about Dr. Irwin because uh, it's such a great American story that I think uh, he speaks eloquently to it himself. So without further ado, I'll hand over to uh, Dr. Irwin. Thank you for joining us, sir. John, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to get down this way. I actually, um, one of your uh, neighbors, I uh, have a home down in Key Largo, so I may get down here as often as I can, and maybe I'll be coming even more because my youngest is uh, very much interested in coming to school at the University of Miami, so maybe if y'all will have him, I will be here even, even more. I want to talk to you today about um, urgent care. I want to talk about what it is, where it came from, where we are, and where it's going. And uh, to begin with, um, what is urgent care? It's not what you think. It really isn't. The, the conventional wisdom is urgent care is a place where people are diverted from the emergency room show up. It is that, but it's a lot, lot more. It's where people come for accessible health care. And that's how we prefer to define what we do as accessible health care, not just urgent care, because more and more people are coming to urgent care clinics clinics for more and more things. In fact, we see that what we have done is not so much uh, create many clinics, many emergency rooms. We've actually created a new access point in the healthcare system. We have a way for people to access healthcare quickly, easily, whether we treat them or not, or whether we just get them into the system. You know, instead of waiting, if, if you're seen by us and we think you need to be seen, Quickly, the hospitals, the specialists respect us, and so we can help you get into the system. Uh, we don't think of our clinics so much as uh, an urgent care clinic, as a tr intersection of healthcare, uh, because more and more people are using it, and we are perfectly positioned to take care of more and more uh, things as the needs for primary care expand. Uh, I'll address this slide a little, little bit more in, in a minute. Um, I always like to show this slide, and it's a little bit of what John was alluding to. Uh, we should all honor our roots. To do, to help create urgent care 
and to think outside the box and do things differently. I think sometimes you have to have a different perspective. This is my Harvard School of Business. <laughs> I, uh, my father was in an accident and lost his legs just a few months before I was born. And later on, he was retrained to repair shoes. And this was his shoe shop. And if you look carefully, there's a wheelchair where I rode him every day down to that shop and uh, helped him get inside. And then every afternoon, I came after school and I would help him repair shoes. In fact, I'm probably am the only physician qualified to take care of both body and soul. <laughs> but but I, I learned a, um, a great deal about business and people. Um, I want to talk a little bit about AFC, uh, where it came from. Uh, I'm sorry, I lost my place. I, uh, anyway, uh, this is our logo, this is our 30th anniversary, and now we're coming up on 36 years. So we've done this a long time. American Family Care, we are one of the leaders in urgent care. We have 197 offices in 26 states. Um, Bill, you want to keep up? <laughs> okay. Uh, this is just an overview of the urgent care industry. In 2013, there were approximately 9,400. Predict, predicted there'll be 11,400 forward. Um, if you look at why the attractiveness financially, just comparing it to the emergency department, the average cost of urgent care is $156. In emergency department, it would be about $570. Um, and if you look at the ownership of urgent care, you'll see many are corporate-owned, hospital-owned. 2% are franchises, and that 2%, by the way, they're all mine. Um, and then there are other owners, but the spot, slide speaks for itself. Our company overview, we're the lead, leading provider of urgent care. As I said, we have almost 200 offices throughout the country. You can see from the geographic uh, distribution. Uh, this year we will treat almost 3 million patients. We are located in uh, Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, and as the slide shows, uh, we're throughout the United States. And also, this is our clinics. Uh, we believe that our clinics are cut above the rest. These clinics are located throughout the country. One of the problems in urgent care, and I'm using the term urgent care, I'd much rather say accessible care, but one of the problems of product differentiation right now, because there is really no standard of what an urgent care center would be, uh, and so a lot of our competitors are in holding the walls between a uh, liquor store and an L salon. And the pay people, when they go to Google, they have no way of knowing that. This is our corporate headquarters, which we moved into a few years ago. It's 40,000 square feet of state-of-the-art um, equipment, security, and everything. We call this our launch pad. Uh, we, when we moved in, we had 40% excess capacity. I think that's probably down to about 15%. But it's a beautiful office. And um, see, John, did you? Uh, you you were there. That's right. Um, going back to what I have done and who I am, um, I'm a board-certified family practitioner when I practice. Um, I did emergency medicine. That's where I came up with the idea for this. Um, I became a businessman by necessity. And I guess I'm just an entrepreneur by um, habit. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was one thing that we did that really set us apart. Uh, we franchised our system. I had been approached about franchising a number of years ago. And I really wasn't interested. As a physician, I was a little bit offended. Uh, I didn't know who the franchisees would be. I didn't know how I would manage them. But about five years ago, I was approached by a company that had acquired Doctors Express. We had heard about that. We would heard that a doctor up in Maryland had started franchising uh, urgent care. And we didn't think that he'd be very successful. But we were wrong. They had about 50 clinics. He had sold it to some businessmen. They couldn't run it, so they approached us, and we told them no. And they kept and were persistent because they wanted us to buy the company because they knew we had the, the capabilities to fill in 
the deficits that they didn't have. They couldn't manage it. So we went around the country and we looked at the clinics and we were very happy at what we saw. We saw that these clinics were in good locations, they were nice facilities, and they were pro providing good care. The people that owned them were business people, they weren't doctors. 68% of our franchisees have a master's or greater. And so we decided to buy it, and we have grown that now from 50 units to 127 franchise units. The one thing that we learned in this uh, acquisition that is very, very important, and we didn't realize it at the time, it's an advantage that we have over our competitors. Because as we grew and as we extended our supply lines, it became more and more difficult to manage clinics and to recruit uh, adequate people and to monitor them. But with the franchisees, we solved a problem that we didn't think could be solved. These people live in the community and they bring that local aspect. So we believe that, that our company will continue to grow and outstrip our competitors, which most of them we already have, because of the uniqueness of the franchise system. You know, you may think franchising healthcare, it's really no different than any other part of healthcare. If you think about it, a hospital, a for-profit hospital, is uh, owned by investors, it's run by administrators who work with providers. All we've done is squashed it down to a 4,000 square foot box. It's a unique way for people to invest in healthcare. And the men and the women really enjoy it because they get to not only run a successful business, but they get to make a difference. This is an important slide. This is Lyndon Johnson signing the Medicare enactment in July of 1965. That was the end of medicine as it was. I'm not going to say it was good or bad. I think it probably was good in the long run. But what happened? Let's talk about health care before he moved that pen. Before that pen was moved, health care was more of a local phenomenon. Health care was patient-centric. It was hospital. It was doctor's office-centered. Hospitals were smaller. What there were were either owned by the communities or other government entities, or they were owned by not-for-profit entities. That was how health care. And the doctors were not in the POBs. They were out in the neighborhood. So we had a system that was patient-centric. It was physician-centric. But by signing that, that was the era of, big, of medicine becoming a big business. And from that point on, in fact, ACA, the largest not-for-profit hospital, the Frist family started it three years after that, in 1968, largely by buying Kilburton hospitals, which had been created by the government in the post-World War II era. So now we had a total change in our healthcare system. We now have the era of hospitals with a bed for every person. We also had a change in the way healthcare was practiced. Instead of primary care being the main focus, prior to the enactment of the Medicare bill, about one in eight doctors specialized. And the number of specialties that there were were much smaller. But after that, we turned healthcare into big business, big pharma. There's a hospital bed for every patient. There's a specialist for any kind of illness and a pill for whatever ails you. Uh, my daughter lives in Europe, and uh, when I'm over there, and they, her friends find out I'm a doctor, they refer to us as the Pillhead Society. <laughs> so, what did all this lead us to? It left us to a healthcare system that was hospital-centric, specialist-centric, it became very expensive, difficult to get. So people started flooding emergency rooms, and they still do. Uh, and as an ER doctor, when these people would come in at 2 o'clock in the morning with a sore throat, you really didn't treat them as kindly as you should. And we had a name for those people. We called them gomers, which stood for get out of my emergency room. But you know, it wasn't their fault. It really wasn't. They didn't have any choices. What, what were they going to do? They could call a doctor and wait on an appointment, probably be well or dead before they got it. They could go maybe buy something over the counter didn't have retail clinics there either. Uh, or they'd go to the emergency room and wait for hours, and many of them did. 
So, due to my background and, and being blessed with, with decent mind, uh, I thought about it outside the box. I thought there had to be a better way. What is the problem? There's too many people emergency rooms. What's the answer? Get them out of the emergency rooms. And that was the beginning of urgent care. I won't tell you that I was the first person in the country to open an urgent care center. Pretty close. I was one of the first ten. I opened the first one in the southeast. Uh, but I was the first one to conceive of urgent care as it is today. And I put this up here because I, I have to put it back there. There was no Google. There was no internet. There was nobody that knew what I was doing. I told a group of friends the other day, they were saying, what do you think about consultants? I said, I don't think much of them because most of what I've done, there was nobody to consult. So I would have loved to have Google. And as I look around at all the other people that, that I have to compete with, uh, it, it, i tell you a funny story. Uh, it, we've all heard of Mad Express, okay? That was acquired by a PE firm back in about 2008, 2009. They wanted to acquire my company to merge with it. Maybe I should have. Um, but I went up to West Virginia to look at one of their facilities. And I'm in the facility and I'm walking around and talking to Frank Alderman, who's the CEO, um, still is. And I saw a patient encounter form on the counter. And I looked at it and I knew it was mine. It was a unique encounter form, the speckled paper days, that I had drawn out with pencil and piece of paper. And I said, where'd you get that? And he said, I got it from you. I said, I've never met you before today. So he mentioned the doctor that had worked for me several years before. He said, you know, Woody or whatever his name, he brought me all of your forms. So I, I've seen that all over. But again, there was no Google. So I had a medical model. The medical model was I was going to get people out of the ER. And another thing that I did uniquely was that I never planned on opening one clinic. Never. My original business plan called for four clinics to be built in the Birmingham area and to be built in less than three years. Picked out the sites. I knew nothing about what I was doing. I had no business background, but I learned everything. I learned about uh, how to choose a real estate site. I learned about demogra demographics. I learned about working with an architect. I'm sorry to keep turning away from you. I can see it over there. Uh, I, I, I got an architect, kindly gentleman. I told him what I wanted. I did time and motion studies. I laid everything out. I, 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 in fact, not too long ago, I saw the movie The Founders, and they were talking about how they laid everything out in their restaurant. And I said, well, darn, I've never seen this movie, but that's what I did. I figured everything out. And I knew that for it to be successful, I had to be patient-centric. Everything. Now, again, the patient had been treated like, well, not, not patient-centric, but I wanted to put the patient first. I wanted it all to be about the patient. I also didn't want to make it all about one doctor. I wanted to create a brand where people could go and they knew that they were going to get quality, consistent health care. It was never about the doctor. We've never had an ad about John Smith just joined our practice. It's about you knowing what you're getting. It's about you being in New York City watching a Broadway play and you see our logo and you know what you're going to get in there. And furthermore, we got your record because all our clinics are electronically connected. But to make it work, I had to have a business model. Now I'm building these clinics. I'm going to keep them open from 8 in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. That's expensive. I'm going to equip them like an emergency room. That's expensive. I'm going to pay for all these people. This is not an easy business. It's very capital intense. It's employee intense. It's specialized employee. And the worst, not the last, last and the worst is you don't get paid by your customer. You get paid by somebody else. So I had to have a business model where I could make money out of this thing. And so I decided that I would centralize all business functions. There was to be no insurance filing room in each of the clinics. There was not going to be personnel for that. So I centralized all business functions. Still new to this day, that 40,000 square foot building. Um, and I was able to take care of economies of scale. We buy some things, well I shouldn't say this because it's not going to surprise you. I was going to say we buy things, some, some things cheaper than the U.S. government. <laughs> not so good. We buy things much better than the U.S. government and many hospitals. So we took care of economies of, of scale, we used that. The other thing we did was we embraced, embraced technology. 
My second clinic opened in 19, early 1984. Both of those two clinics were connected electronically. I had big deck computers, you know, the refrigerator size, connecting those clinics. And we continued that. And we still use technology. We use it for market surveys. Uh, we use it, every, patients can register on the internet. They can uh, put in all their information. They can get in the queue. So we embrace technology and the new modern era of electronic media. Uh, that's another story. It's changed everything. The other thing that we did was that we decided that we were going to learn from our patients and we were going to constantly improve. The second day of operation, June 15, 1982, we called every patient back. Every patient since then has been called back. Now sometimes we, we connect with them electronically now, but we want to know were they happy. The other thing, we monitor NPS scores, and I'll mention that in a minute. And the next thing I was going to do uh, is I was going to, well, I'm talking about monitoring that. We have a program called PS, it's all about you. And it's, it's the basis of our in-house marketing program. It's about our employees are empowered to recognize and take care of a complaint. I guess it's the ritz call model, whatever it is. It works. Uh, but we do put our patients first. Our goal is 100% patient satisfaction. Uh, from time to time, I get a complaint letter, and when it falls into my lap, I always start my response. I'm sorry you had a bad experience. Our goal is 100% patient satisfaction. In your case, we failed. How can I make it right? And, and that's how we view our patients. And it um, is work, as you can see, 75% of our patients are people who have used us before. They come back. There are people in Birmingham, Alabama, who are in their 30s who have never seen another doctor but American Family Care. So how's that for urgent care? So they're just using us for urgent things. They use us for everything. Uh, the last thing, which was really, really controversial in 1982, is I was going to advertise. Doctors didn't advertise. If you were a doctor, you advertised, that meant, hmm, I don't think I'll go to him. He's not a good doctor. And as a consequence, nobody did it, and nobody knew how to do it. But I believe that we were doing something new. It was unique. People didn't know what we were going to do. I didn't want to hide my light under a barrel. So we marketed it. And I went to an advertising agency, and I said, show me how to do this. They said, uh, we've never done this, but if you'll give us a retainer of $20,000, we'll do it. Uh, $20,000 in 1982 is still a lot of money, but it was really a lot then. But you know, I did lots of research, and having gone to medical school and residency and so forth, I knew how to do that. So I researched about people and how to reach them. This brochure, and by the way, we just found this a few weeks ago. I mean, I had cried my eyes out trying to find this brochure. And this isn't even the original one because by the time we were still using this, we already had five locations and we were adding two more. But, and this was an architectural rendering of the building because I printed these up before I even had the building constructed. But I sat down and I drew it out. And on the inside, I don't think we have the inside of the building. You know, I explained what our services were. And I did a direct mail piece to the people within a five mile radius of the first clinic. It worked. The first day, we saw 43 patients and were quite profitable. And from that day on, we were, we were profitable. We never, never lost a penny. Can't say that about all the clinics. Uh, two years later, little old ladies would come in holding onto that, that worn out brochure. That, I love that brochure. We wouldn't be here without it. Um, Everything we did in preparation to open the clinics, I summarized in our mission statement. And I wrote this thing before we opened the clinic. I've never changed a word. This mission statement and three questions we always ask, does our patient really need it? Can we do it as well as it can be done? And can we do it in an economical fashion? Those questions and this mission statement is the heart. This is our secret sauce. We're going to provide the best health care possible. Nothing unique about that. We're going to do it in a kind and caring environment. Nah, that was really kind of unique because patients weren't good first. We were going to respect all the rights of the patients. We didn't need HIPAA. We didn't need HIPAA. We didn't need the government telling us how to take care of patients because we were going to do it all right up front. We were going to do it in an economical manner. 
We weren't going to overcharge. We were going to do exactly what was needed. We were going to provide the right care right now, which is one of our slogans. And we were going to do it at times and locations convenient to the patients. We were going back to the neighborhoods. And we did. We went back to the neighborhoods. And now everywhere you look, there's urgent care. And it's tough competition. I know, I'm kind of proud of Papa on one hand, but I wish they'd get their hand off my plate. <laughs> As a result of all our works, uh, I'm just bragging here, uh, our average rating is 4.4. Uh, we've had over 11,400, is that right? Uh, reviews across, well that's wrong, 190 something locations. How many of y'all know what a NPS score is? Net Promoter Score? It's used everywhere and it measures customer satisfaction. Uh, ours is 78, which believe it or not is very high. If you look at Starbucks, they're 77, KFC's 53, and Walmart, where we all shop at least once a week, is a 40. Not anymore, I use that one. Um, so we're very proud of the services. Now I want to talk briefly about what happened over the past three and a half decades. The first part of, of urgent care I refer to as the Doc in the Box. Uh, so you probably don't remember, the Time Magazine, when urgent care was really uh, exploding, wrote an article on the front that they had a doctor jumping out of a uh, jack-in-the-box. That's not the original, God, I could never find it, but that was a jack-in-the-box. That was our version of a doc-in-the-box. We had very nice boxes and we were very proud of them. But during that first era, during that first era, uh, it was much like it's been the past 10 years. I like to say history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does resemble. So this was 1980, from the early 1980s up until the mid-90s. Everybody jumped in to urgent care. They jumped in. Hospitals, you guys, started opening urgent care clinics. Other doctors started opening urgent care clinics. The PE world, of course, got involved. They started buying urgent care. Um, if I had sold my clinics during that time, I, I probably would have done real well. And, and not worked near as hard. But that was the era. And everyone thought that urgent care was the greatest investment, the greatest thing that ever happened in healthcare. But then towards the end of that era, uh, up until the mid-90s, uh, about that time, urgent care, the, the, the bloom was off the flower, whatever you say. The PE firm said it's time to get out. The hospital said, you know, we really can't manage these things, so we need to get out. And a lot of the physician groups got out. And then also about that time, there were two physician practice management companies that uh, we kind of got grouped with that because that's really what we do, we manage practices. They were going to merge and then it imploded. It was um, Med Partners and Fico. Uh, but they, that fell apart. And so that was a disaster on Wall Street. So it kind of went away. Now, in about 2007 or so, urgent care became hot again. And you now have a situation where everybody and their brothers in urgent care, many clinics, Walgreens, etc. But we've come to that inflection point again. Again, the glow is coming off of urgent care a little bit. PE firms have pulled out. They're still interested in cell address. Uh, hospitals are still growing, some. But the growth of urgent care has slowed down. You know, I was talking to an investment group the other day. They said, well, we're just kind of not interested in urgent care right now because we don't know what's going on. I said, well, I'm with you. I understand the same thing, but to me it's an opportunity. Uh, urgent care is not going away this time. The tailwinds behind urgent care are much stronger. Um, when I first started, the insurance companies didn't know what we did. They didn't understand. They thought we would increase health care. Hospitals were threatened. They wanted to compete with us. They wanted to go after us. My fellow physicians were threatened. I had physicians that I thought were friends that um, they weren't friends. But the patients did get it. And the patients still get it. But the tailwinds are much stronger now because all those things are gone. 
The patients understand, the insurance companies understand, the healthcare system understands, and they want urgent care, and they want primary care. A lot of you are economists, okay? Now, if, if you want something, and an item becomes scarce, you're willing to pay more for it to get it, right? That's the law of economics, the way I understand it. Well then, why do we have a situation where they say we need more primary care doctors, but they're not willing to pay for it? So is there a scarcity of primary care doctors? I don't know. The law of economics is not reacting in that way. But what we're seeing now is investors are still interested. They want to come in, but they want to come in with proven winners, people who know what they're doing. The biggest thing that's going on right now is a consolidation. One of y'all mentioned MD Now, which is in the process of being sold. Um, I think that the consolidation has to happen. If any of y'all remember the hamburger days, back when McDonald's came along, there were a dozen brands. There were Biff Burgers, Barf Burgers, whatever. And, and so a consolidation took place. And that's happening now. One of the issues with urgent care right now is the Affordable Care Act. And, and listen carefully, because most of you don't know what I'm about to tell you. Beware the law of unintended consequences. The ACA was supposed to bring a lot of new patients into the health care. Everybody anticipated that we were going to have a mini Medicare. There was going to be another boom into health care. Folks, that's not what happened. Just the opposite happened. What happened was insurance companies started raising their rates. And in response, the normal people who had insurance started raising their co-pays and deductibles. So health care utilization actually plummeted. And uh, insurance companies have been doing quite well. I got to see the documents on uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama just this past week. A friend of mine, he said, don't tell anybody where you got it. So I, he was a friend of mine. I won't tell you who he is. But their profits went from, at the beginning of the ACA coming out, their profits were about $150 million. This past year, they were $468 million. So healthcare utilization is down. Uh, but if you're in the insurance business, it's good for you. The problem with access to, to care is still there. I've already addressed that. Other things that's going on is telemedicine. Um, I had an opportunity to get into telemedicine early. I didn't. Um, I don't want to be the first and lose it all. I'd rather... The tortoise wins every time. Uh, telemedicine has a place. It has a place as an adjunct to a healthcare system, such as a hospital or American Family Care. We are involved in that and we are adding it to our clinics. Uh, but we will continue to grow. We're opening a clinic every 10 days. Uh, by the end of this year, we'll have an additional 35 to 40 clinics. Uh, the franchise system works. Uh, our franchisees have been very, very successful while maintaining this high ratings, high score. And by the way, uh, we're very low risk type of practice medicine. In my years, 37 years, millions and millions of people, I think we've been sued maybe 14 times. Never lost us. So, I mean, it's not a risky business. You know, one of the most important things that has happened at the end of the last century and this, which I'm very proud of because I think urgent care had a lot to do with what, with this. It's the rise of consumerism. In fact, the most important moment for healthcare may be the rise of consumerism. Because now healthcare realizes that patients are valuable. I trained in a public hospital. Uh, most of the patients that came there were very grateful to get to see a doctor. And so as a physician, we kind of developed that attitude. But when you go out in the real world, you better be grateful that they're coming there. You know, patients do have a choice. And they're realizing it, and they're voicing that. And so you are seeing healthcare be much more attentive to the needs of patients. Uh, one quick word. Um, this issue of accessible care, it is not just in the United States. It's in Scandinavia, with a totally socialized medicine. It's in China. It's in South America. It's in Dubai. It's in Saudi Arabia. It's all over the world. The lack of access to health care is a major health care problem. What we have learned is if you make health care accessible, I like to say, why shouldn't health care be as accessible as 
bad food. Uh, but if you make health care accessible, people, they're seen quicker. Their problems are figured out quicker. Treatment is instigated quicker. You get better results at a cheaper cost. And along with this, the biggest problem that our society faces right now is chronic disease. You know, we neglected, us baby boomers, nobody told us not to get a double order of french fries. Nobody told us that baby oil was not suntan lotion. So a lot of people have a lot of health care problems now. And we believe that urgent care is going to play a large role in helping solve those. Our vision, uh, you know, you got to have you gotta have a mission statement. You gotta have core values, and then you gotta have a vision. And our vision is, quite frankly, to become one of the most widely known and admired healthcare brands. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I get the part I like. I don't like standing up there. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Irwin. This is uh, really great. I, I just want to explain to the audience that uh, when I was at Harvard Business School, I had the privilege of uh, going down to Birmingham and uh, spending some time with the company, out of which came a uh, Harvard Business School case study on American family care. And I think some of our students have already uh, had the uh, benefit of studying that and discussing it in class. Uh, before opening up uh, to the audience, I want to just ask you uh, three questions, if I may. Um, the first, the first one is, um, I want you to tell us a little bit more about the, the IT in the back office, which I found to be extraordinarily impressive in terms of your monitoring of the uh, operations in each of these locations uh, every day. So, can you just talk about that as a yeah. competitive advantage? I, I'm glad you mentioned that. It is a competitive advantage. In fact, I don't know anybody. Uh, in our industry, or maybe even in healthcare, that uses IT the way we do. You know, first of all, we see the patient's experience. It begins when they look at Google or learn about our clinics, and it ends when the whole electronic process and the, the adjudication of claims, so it, it's the whole process. So we are technology. But we, we use technology on, on this device right here. I can pull up a dashboard, and on this dashboard, it will show me every single clinic that we have. It will show me how many, in real time, how many patients have been seen uh, up to that point. It will tell me how long they've been in there. We pride ourselves on turnaround time. Uh, we, 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 we run our system so efficiently that even without interrupting the doctors, what we call FaceTime, we can get patients in and about, in and out in an average of 68 minutes. And we monitor that in real time. So with this, I know what's happening uh, at all the clinics at all time. I know which doctor is uh, working. I know what the turnaround time is. And by the way, if the turnaround time is too long, I can also go to another dashboard and I have closed circuit TV where I can see that clinic and I can see the parking lot. I can see the waiting room. I can see the front office. I can't see in the exam room, but I can see what's going on. I want to. Uh, well, we can see what's going on. So we, we use technology constantly. And one, one of the things that also impressed me was that it's not just used to monitor uh, doctors who are uh, taking too long. It's also monitored, also monitoring doctors who are taking too short a time I, for patients. Can you speak we, to that? Yes, I can. And, and we did all this back when it was done manually. Uh, we keep up, we track, our doctors are probably more closely managed than anybody in healthcare, and they always have been. We track everything. We track how long they are with the patient. If it's too short, then we go back and we look at their medical records and we see are they providing adequate care or not. If it's too long, we want to know, are you going in there talking about your grandkids all day? We're here to take care of patients and not your tomato plants. Uh, so so we, we monitor that. We also monitor all their, uh, the metrics. The level of care of each patient, what they're charging the patient, how many injections they give, how many x-rays they give, whatever. And we monitor that and we have a benchmark standard of care, which we compare to national standards of care. And so we can pick out a problem with a doctor probably before he knows he has a problem and we can intervene. And also we reward the doctors who uh, 
uh, are, are performing better. And we continue to monitor this and we use it in our training programs. At any clinic, um, there's only one doctor typically on duty at one time, is that? It depends right. on the level of service. Right. Um, I mean, but at many, at many of them that's the case. Mm -hmm. And I remember you telling me that, you know, you. you your description of the kind of doctor that you needed was a short order cook. Short order cook. Tell, tell, tell us uh, <laughs> what you meant by that. Well, you know, if the days of, of, of you know, I, I, our healthcare system, we got too many people and not enough doctors, and we don't have time to, to uh, you know, spend an hour with each patient or treat one patient, and then after you're through with that one, go to another. So I envision like short order cook. Uh, you've got to be able to keep up with a lot of things. You gotta know how long that the toast has been in the toaster. You gotta know how long the eggs, how long the bacon. You gotta know, and by the way, here's another order, and here's another order. So our doctors are trained to, to uh, prioritize. First of all, one thing I wanna say real quick. We value the same thing that you value. We value time. We value your time. We value all of our patients' time. And this is part of what, what, what I was saying, is that they're taught to uh, Prioritize patients. If you've got a patient that you know by looking at the medical record is going to need an x-ray, then and you know there's six x-rays away to be taken, don't see that patient. Go see this patient that maybe has a sore throat, maybe going to need a swab of the throat. You start that. By that time, x-ray. And by the way, you got a laceration that just came in. Go see the laceration, anesthetize the laceration, tell the nurse to get the prep done. So now you go, you discharge the patient with the sore throat, you take the x-ray, you sew up the laceration, then you go to the next patient. And um, that's the way to practice good, efficient medicine. And a lot of the doctors whom I met came from the military. Yes, quite a number. In fact, our new medical officer, which I'm, I was so proud of this, but given the news events of, uh, the, the past few days, and I feel really sorry for Dr. Jackson. Uh, our chief medical officer is second in command at the White House. In fact, we were afraid when Jackson was uh, nominated to be the uh, veterans man that he was going to send us a letter and say, no, I'm not coming. But he actually sent us a text and said, they offered it to me, don't worry, I'm tired of the politics. So, yeah, he's military. He's a major in, in the Air Force. But uh, we, we, we like doctors that come from the military because they're very good at seeing patients That's efficiently. Triage. Yes, at triage. And ER docs, too. They're not real good on patient uh, professionalism, so we have to work with them on that. Because they're, they're used to seeing a population that doesn't have a choice. And, and finally, before we open it up, if someone wanted to be a franchisee, and I think you would interview them personally, what would be the three qualities that you would be looking for in a potential franchisee? But you know, one of the reasons that we have succeeded so well with this system, uh, much better than the previous owners, is we decided that we would be much, much more selective about who we would let become franchisee. Because it's our brand, it's my brand, it's my life. Uh, I'm very brand conscious. Uh, I, I failed to mention, though, I'll come back to that. Uh, so I would say someone that's a good businessman, that understands quality, that understands uh, patient satisfaction. Uh, they're successful in business by definition because they couldn't afford to do it otherwise. So those are the traits we look at. And, and, and the one thing that I do say to all of them, this is not an easy business. If you're not willing to roll your sleeves up, get your hands dirty, I've got a stack of $100 bills and for each of you to leave, I'll give you $100 to leave. Uh, the and, the, and the community-based uh, local knowledge as well. Absolutely, and, 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 and that is, as I said, that's the secret weapon. Yeah. You know, quick aside real quick, I showed the slide up there and uh, uh, I, I didn't really emphasize it. Our name originally was Merchant Medicine of South, EMS, which is a play on the acronym on ambulances, Merchant Medical Services. After two years, I changed it to American Family Care. And the reason I did were two things. One, I found that we weren't seeing who I thought we were seeing. We were seeing primary care. Uh, we were seeing Aunt Med. We were seeing a much broader thing. And uh, so I changed the name to American Family Care, and I did because it better described what we really did. And it was a name that I thought one day could become a national brand. So here we are. Okay. Uh, three or four questions. So uh, keep them short, uh, if you wouldn't mind. We're short on time. Uh, yes, we'll take uh, you first. Can you just introduce yourself as well, uh, especially if you're a student? 
Sure. Uh, my name is Benjamin Saltzman. Uh, I'm an employee here at the university, uh -huh. but I also am a current Master's in Health Administration student. And as Dean Quilch mentioned, I did happen to read his Harvard Business Journal. Uh, Which I'm very grateful for. <laughs> um, it was excellent. Uh, thing. And he also came in and taught, taught it to our class, one of the first times he actually went in and taught it. And, you know, I, I read it front to back, and one interesting thing that I thought about was in 2016, 15 million dollars were spent on marketing. Can you go into how that marketing campaign was kind of launched and how you came up with a 15 million dollar number for marketing? Because that, that seems... Bill, like Bill, Bill is our chief marketing officer, and, and it, it, I'll say a couple of things and then he can address it too. When Bill joined me, he said, what's our marketing budget? I said, you don't have a budget. As long as you can show that there is an ROI on what you're doing, then you can spend money. Uh, but that, you know, that's over a hundred and something offices throughout the country. I think, Bill, you want to address that real quick? Sure, I'd be happy to. So that number is actually an aggregated number. It's not all spent centrally. So we have, again, 200 clinics across the United States, and each of those franchisees are executing their own marketing plans in market uh, very locally. So it's, it's not like Dr. Irwin says, here's Colazar, here's $15 million, let me know how it all works out. This is uh, 75 franchisees across 26 states that are in market. They're doing local health fairs, they're doing church bazaars, they're, do they're sponsoring high school football games, and, and it's very, very decentralized. Uh, and so that's, uh, it's not like a large national uh, television buy or something like that. So I hope that helps answer the question. They're required to spend $2,000 a month, and they also pay 1% of their revenues into a marketing fund. And, and you know, our marketing is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And Bill has done a marvelous job in terms of public relations and the national promise. I have a slide that shows what people are saying about us. And, uh, you know, I've, I've told him I'm really, I'm really a pretty shy person. And uh, I said, please, I'm don't get my name in the paper again. But he, he, he's been very good at that. All right, well, super. Let, let's take a couple more questions. Uh, I think there was one at the front. Yeah, yeah. please. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. Hold on. Um, I'm a 40-year industry executive, retired, but I'm very active on the market, uh, primarily in the middle segment, the Latino market. Mm -hmm. uh, just out of curiosity, what percent of the patients are Latino versus non-Latino? Two-part question. Do you know the new competition is coming from Mexico on the second question? Well, on the first question, that certainly varies by region. Uh, we have clinics in uh, San Diego, we have clinics in uh, Texas, we have clinics in Florida. Uh, so in the areas, I, I would, you know, I haven't really tracked that, but I, I'm certain that it would be corresponding with the penetration of the Latino community right. in those areas. It, on a growth perspective, and the concept is more appealing to them, because the, especially I'm talking about the male segment, they don't understand insurance. They no, they grow, don't. They, they grow up in insurance, and they love the relationship component. They're much more loyal. Once you hit them with the mentality that you have, they are going to stick around longer. In almost all of our locations, we have at least one person who uh, speaks Spanish. And in the locations we don't, we have a service that we call into. I mean, the, the Latino uh, community is very, very important to this country. No, I just wanted to see yeah. if you had any metrics on that. And as far as competition from Mexico, I think. Some of the capitals from Mexico, they're, they're two of the three largest mm -hmm. capital people in Mexico yeah. have been investing on the border. And they're coming up with a dual mm -hmm. link. You can have a clinic. Oh, let's say Tucson side, mm -hmm. and then you can go to Morales yeah. and have the same thing, and that's growing and that's been growing significantly mm -hmm. in the last four or five years. I, would say. I actually am very familiar with the Mexican market. I, I owned part of a uh, family practice company in Mexico about a dozen years ago, and uh, we were in uh, Rosario, we were in Monterey, we were in Mexico City. I think we had about 15 clinics when I exited. But, uh, we were mainly dealing with industries like Televisa, who were, they were direct, we were building clinics for them. As you, yeah, I'm certain you understand that. All right, let's uh, go over here. Yes, sir, you, you've got the microphone. Hold on for a second. Come back to medical. At what 
point do you refer patients out to say hospital? I can give you two examples. Okay. Say I um, was given my diabetic dog insulin. I used the needle twice and it didn't come out of the stopper when I ran it to a finger. Mm -hmm. The finger blew up and I went to the doctor's hospital here and uh, they ended up keeping me for four days with a poison doctor. Mm -hmm. Another situation, uh, I'm not feeling well, I'm cold. Uh, I made it over to the doctor's hospital. Go in, they say I'm having a heart attack. They do the tests, they shove me over to South Miami Hospital here, mm -hmm. a couple of stents. So you don't there were certain patients you don't keep. No, and, and that's what I was alluding to earlier. Uh, that's one of the things that we're most uh, proud of is that we can, you know, maybe maybe you can get to the emergency room, maybe you come into our clinic. We we're all trained. I mean we're all good physicians. We recognize that. You know. You, you infected finger. Hey man, I understand that. You know, you, you're having chest pain. I'll have an ambulance here to get you. So, you know, we, we know what we can, you know, a good doctor, it's not what he knows, it's that he knows what he doesn't know. I think you had, um, if I remember rightly, about 2%, am I right, of the patients who present are referred on to uh, uh, the hospital or yeah, the it, ER, something like that? It's about 2% that are referred directly on to the emergency room, but then it's, it's more like 20% who are referred on for either other diagnostic studies or to a specialist. Okay, uh, yes sir, at the front, hold on for the mic if you wouldn't mind. Hopefully the mic is working. I'm not sure. <coughs> First, a smart ass comment. If you're looking for fast order doctors, check out China. If, I, if I'm looking for what? Fast order doctors. Short order check out, Short order cooks. Yeah. Check I, out doctors in China. They work on so many of the same I, I, I actually am doing business in China. Well, that was my next question. Yeah. Are you doing business in China? And if so, in, on what capacity? Yeah, we've been to China twice. I've been working on this for about two years. In fact, all next week I'm meeting with Chinese businessmen in my office in Birmingham. I've got two groups. We've been to Beijing, Shanghai. We've been to uh, Shenzhen. We've been to uh, Hong Kong. Uh, we have a pretty good working knowledge of the healthcare system in China. They have no primary care, mm -hmm. and the government wants us. They want primary care. They want health care in their five-year plan, health care within every citizen uh, within 30 miles, within five years. We're trying to open up a to move on China. Oh, yeah. Okay. We need um, over here on the left, front row. Oh. No, thank you. A very good one. Congratulations for a beautiful story and uh, thanks for uh, bringing the patient to, to our attention as well. I'm a myself from a Sony World Form of Artists from a Oh, yeah. We, I, <laughs> I have another company. We, we, we do business with Marta, from oh, another a chronic disease company that I have not touched. Well, you, you mentioned that uh, yeah. chronic disease is cre yeah. created a new change in the way that we practice medicine. I was uh, just thinking about how your envision in the, that practice will affect. Uh, your dynamic as well, and how you're preparing uh, to have more and more chronic diseases management in your in your practice. Yeah, and I'll, let, I'll, I'll answer it brief as I can because it's a very complex question. Basically, we see our clinics as, as points of intersection of healthcare. You know, we're a contact point. We're in the neighborhoods. We're we are there, and and this started from day one. That brochure I showed you on the inside had a whole section about primary care and what we could treat. But, you know, we're perfectly poised to meet the need that is in this country now in terms of identifying and monitoring chronic disease. Uh, you don't need to go to a cardiologist to get your blood pressure checked. You don't need to go to diabetes, the endocrinologist to get your diabetes checked. So our doctors are trained to do that. It's really a mindset that, that, that has to come across to the physician and the public. But it's going to happen no matter what. I mean, the economic forces and the population forces are just so dynamic. There's nothing you can do about it. So we embrace that. Last question. Uh, are you in Miami and are you coming to Miami? We, <laughs> we have one clinic in Miami and I'm embarrassed. I don't know where it is. Lots of Hatch It's where? Lots of Hatch Lot to hatch grow. We have a developer in here that is, I don't know if he's already got his sites, but there's nine more that are going to be built in the greater Miami area probably within, at least within the next 18 months. I'm, in my, I'm down here, I'm in Largo right there. I need a place to go. <laughs> All right, let's give uh, Dr. Irwin a big uh, round
as I, as I always like to point out, the National Press Club in Washington is a very generous organization, and everyone who comes to speak at the National Press Club gets a National Press Club mug. And so uh, we have followed in that tradition, and so, uh, yeah, uh, you're getting it right, you're getting it right. Uh, so I want to present you with the uh, Miami Business School mug, and uh, thank you again for sharing with us, and good luck in uh, the expansion here. We look forward to having more competition and more choice. All right, thanks a lot. I, I'm going to give this to my son as a general nudge. <laughs>